What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, continuing our reading of the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, today, number 19, on October 30th, 2018. This week's newsletter suggests an update for Sea Lightning users, describes a discussion about BIP69 deterministic input output ordering on the mailing list, and notable public overt ASIC boost support is available for miners using Antminer S9, and provides links to resources about both Square's open sourced Zub0 hardware security module based multi signature cold storage solution and the recent Lightning Network residency and Hack Day in New York City. Also included are selected recent Q&As from Bitcoin Stack Exchange and descriptions of notable code changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Update to Sea Lightning version 0.6.2 fixes a bug where the node would send an excessive number of update announcements to its peers about dead channels. News. BIP69 discussion with BIP from 2015 adopted by several notable wallets specif specifies an optional method for deterministically ordering inputs and outputs within a transaction based on the public content of the transaction. However, other wallets have not adopted it or even rejected it as unsuitable for adoption leading perhaps to a worst-of-both-worlds situation where wallets using BIP69 can be fairly easily identified and so wallets not using BIP69 might, may also be easily to identified by negation. In this thread on the Bitcoin Dev mailing list, Ryan Havar suggested that one reason wallet authors like BIP69 is that it deterministic ordering makes it easy and fast for their tests to ensure that they haven't leaked any information about the source of their inputs or the destination of their outputs. For example, in some old wallets, the first output always went to the recipient and the second output was always a change, making coin tracking trivial. Havar su then suggests an alternative deterministic ordering based on private information that would be available to the test suite but not exposed by production wallets, allowing developers who want to thwart blockchain analysis but also have simple and fast tests to mitigate away from BIP69. Overt ASIC boost supported for S9 miners. Support for this efficiency improving feature was announced by both Bitmain and Brains this week. I would stress that Brains was first in this announcement on the World Crypto Network. ASIC Boost takes advantage of the fact that the SHA-256 algorithm used in Bitcoin mining first splice splits the 80-byte block header into 64-byte chunks. If a miner can find multiple proposed block headers where the first chunk of 64 bytes are different but start of the next chunk of 64 bytes are the same, then they can try different combinations of the first chunk and second chunk to reduce the total number of hashing operations they need to carry out to find a valid block. Early estimates indicate an improvement of 10% or perhaps more on existing and minor S9 hardware. The overt form of ASIC boost alters a diversion bits field in the block header which can cause programs such as Bitcoin Core to display a warning such as 13 of the last 100 blocks have unexpected versions. Some ASIC boost miners have voluntarily restricted their altered version bits range to that defined by BIP 320, giving future programs the option to ignore those bits for upgrade signaling. Open source hardware security module based multi-sig cold storage solution. Square has re released code and documentation for the cold storage solution they've implemented to prote protect customer deposits, as well as a command line interface tool for auditing hierarchical deterministic wallet balances at arbitrary points in time. Optech has not evaluated their solution, 
but we can recommend interested parties to read Square's excellent blog post and visit the repo repository of the Sub-Zero Cold Store Solution and Bean Counter Auditing Tool. Lightning Residency and Hack Day. Last week's Chaincode Labs hosted a five-day Lightning Network residency program to help onboard developers to the fledgling protocol. Following this, Fulmo organized their fourth Lightning Network Hack Day, actually two days, also in New York City, with a few, spe few speeches, many demos, and lots of hacking. Piero Shard has written summaries of all the presentations given at the residency program, day one, day two, day three, and day four. And videos of the presentation are expected to be posted soon. Videos of the hack day are available now for both day one and day two. Selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange which is one of the first places Optech contributors look for answers to their questions or when, have, or when we have a few spare moments of time to help answer other people's questions. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. Does Bitcoin running pruned node make the initial sync faster? A question asked by Carol Bilek. During running Bitcoin D with the prune option, make the initial blockchain sync faster or not? I know it makes it smaller on the disk, but is it faster? I keep reading conflicting information online. Some state that it is quicker because you need less disk operations. Some state it is about the same. And here the first answer by Gregory Maxwell. No. Quite simple. <laughs> Pruning will not make the initial sync faster. The information that gets removed by pruning isn't accessible during the initial sync. Currently, pruning makes the initial sync somewhat slower. More frequent flushes are performed and in order to allow pruning to work and work of actually deleting things creates its own small slowdown. About the same is probably a fair statement in general. The only configuration which can substantially speed up the initial sync is increasing the DB cage option. If you have plenty of memory, for example, larger than four gigabytes, making this setting larger can radically reduce the sync time, especially if your disk is slow. For eight gigabytes RAM, I recommend setting DB cage at 4096 during the initial sync. And we have another excellent answer by Jay Bazook. No, it just allows you to define a maximum storage space for your old blocks to use, but it will still download all of the blocks and verify them, deleting them afterwards. And here we see the prune explanation. Reduce storage requirements by enabling pruning, deleting of old blocks. This allows the prune blockchain RPC to be a call to delete specific blocks and enable automatic pruning of old blocks if a target size of in megabyte is provided. This mode is incompatible with transaction index and rescan. Warning, reverting this setting requires re-downloading the entire blockchain. Default zero is disabled pruning blocks. One, allow manual pruning via RPC. Larger than 550 automatically prune blocks filters to stay under the specific target size in megabytes. And that will be 550 megabytes here. To reduce the sync time, you could use the assume valid flag to move the default assumed valid blocks to a later block. But obviously, this is a risk you take. And here are the assume valid hacks. If this block is in the chain, assumes that it and its ancestors are valid and potentially skip their script verification. Zero to verify all. And the default is here, the Genesis block or in testnet, this here. We have another question. Here. Closing a channel in the Lightning Network. I have some doubts about closing a Lightning Network channel. As far as I know, there can be at least four different scenarios. 
this question asked by Bruce Wayne. Oh, we got Batman. First, one node decides to close the channel and the other one accepts the decision. The channel is then successfully closed. Two, one node decides to close the channel, but the other node does not respond to its request. A time period passes and the channel will be closed with the transaction of the first node. In this case, what would happen if a user tries to close the channel with a malicious transaction, for example, with an older transaction, and, that, uh, and the other user does not respond? Three, one node decides to close the channel with an older transaction, and the other node claims all the funds due to the malicious intention. Four, one node decides to close the channel, but the other node refuses. Is it possible that this scenario? And what would happen in this case? And we have an answer here by Christian Decker. Thank you very much for providing this answer. The first three scenarios are indeed possible. The last one is identical to the second. First, this is called a collaborative close. It has the advantage of using a lower on-chain fee since the transactions are not time critical and the users get their coins back immediately, no dispute time. If the other node is unresponsive, offline, or does not sign a, coll a collaborative close, you can do a unilateral close. The downside of a unilateral close is that the closing party will have their funds unavailable until the dispute is settled, usually about 24 hours. And higher fees are leveraged since this is a pre-signed transaction that is time critical to get, un to get confirmed. Three, this is called a breach attempt and is the reason for the dispute period above. The breach is basically publishing an old unilateral closed transaction and it needs to give the counterparty time to react and punish the breaching party. So in all cases, well-behaved parties get their funds back. The difference is just how long it takes. And the last question, energy to confirm one block, question asked by this user. What is the minimum energy of CPU operations required for someone to confirm one block on their own to launch a double spending attack? How can I calculate this from the current difficulty or hash rate? We have two answer, one by Nick Odell and one by Nate Eldridge. First, there is no minimum. In theory, you could find a valid block on your very first attempt the best we can do is an average. Here's the average energy required to find one valid block using CPU mining. Average energy required is the difficulty times two to the power of 32 divided by two to the times 10 to the power of six joules. Or at the current difficulty, which is 1.018 times 10 to the power of 14 joules. Explanation. Difficulty times 2 to the power of 32 is the average number of hashes to find a block. And 2 to the power of 10, 2 times 10 to the power of 6 joules is the, according to the Bitcoin wiki, the typical mining efficiency for CPUs is 2 mega hashes per joule. And we have another answer here by Nate Eldridge. Here is how to compute this in general. I'm intentionally not going to give an example cause using current numbers since A, it will instantly be obsolete and B, it will encourage people to ask for an updated answer rather than learning to work it out for themselves. Determine the current network difficulty, Google Bitcoin difficulty for the current figure, calling it D. Multiply D by two to the power of 32 which is about 4.3 to the power of nine. Call this new number H. The cur this represents the average number of hatches needed to mine one block. Look up the hash rate per unit energy of for current mining hardware. Check this wiki. For the device with the highest number in the mega hashes per joule column, 
multiply this mega hashes per joule number by 1 million to determine the number of hashes per joule performed by this hardware. Call this number E. Divide H by E. And this gives you the number of joules of energy needed to mine one block on average. If you would prefer to measure energy in kilowatt hours, a typical billing unit for electric utilities, then divide the previous number by 3.6 uh, towards the power of 10. Returning back to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, with notable mergers and notable code changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, and again, Lipsack P256K1. A Bitcoin Core merge allows optionally building Bitcoin QT without support for the BIP70 payment protocol and adds a depre depreciation warning indicating the default support may be removed in the future release. The CEO of BitPay, which is the largest user of BIP70, but which wants to use a different version of the protocol, indicated that they supported Bitcoin Core removing BIP70. Developers seem to be in favor of removing this protocol for security reasons, because it seems to client users. The BIP70 dependency on OpenSSL resulting resulted in an emergency release of Bitcoin Core 0.9.1 in 2014 as a result of the Heartbleed vulnerability. And it is expected that removing it will eliminate the risk of future similar vulnerabilities. Another Bitcoin Core merge removes deprecated, depreciated at witness address RPC. This RPC was added in version 0.13.0 to enable testing segregated witness on RecTest and TestNet before it was activated on Mainnet and built into the wallet. UASF, baby. Since version 0.16, Bitcoin Core wallets has supported getting addresses directly using the regular get new address mechanism. Another Bitcoin Core merge depreciates the generate RPC and this method generates new blocks in rec test mode, but it requires getting a new address from Bitcoin Core's built-in wallet in order to pay them in the mining block reward. A replacement method, get generate to address, was introduced in version 0.13, which allows any rec test wallet to generate an address that will be paid the block reward. This is part of an ongoing effort to allow as many RPCs as possible to function without the wallet in order to improve test coverage of non-wallet nodes, as well as to ease the future possible trans transition to fully separating the wallet from the node. And another Bitcoin Core merge adds key origin support to output script descriptors. Besides allowing you to pass an additional argument of the scan outset RPC, this does not this does not currently add any feature to Bitcoin Core. It will enable using key origins in BIP 174 partially signed Bitcoin transactions and watch only wallets when those parts of the software have been updated to use descriptors. See newsletters 5, 7, 9, 12, and 17 for previous discussions of output script descriptors. Key origin support makes it possible to use extended public keys and have been exported for an hierarchical deterministic wallet that uses BIP32 hardened derivation for protecting ancestor private keys which helps making output script descriptors compatible with most hardware wallets. A L&D commit ensures that L&D does not leak information about any of its peers that haven't advertised themselves as public nodes. And to more L&D mergers, add the server-side communication protocol for watchtowers, allowing with many tests verification its proper operation. Correct use of the Lightning Network protocol requires regular monitoring of which transactions get added to the blockchain. So watchtowers are servers designed to help defend the payment channels of users who expect to be offline for an extended period of time. 
as such, watchtowers are considered to be a key feature for enabling wider adoption of LN, of LN Lightning Network by less advanced users. However, a standard specification of watchtowers has not been agreed upon by the multiple implementations of Lightning Network. So LND is only putting this feature out for initial testing and is restricted its use to testnet. Peers, please subscribe to the Optag newsletter, a wealth of resources. And as usual, thank you very much to all the fabulous contributors to this great source of information. Thank you very much for joining me and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.